Between 1826 and 1835, Whitstable was a great attraction for the engineers of the Industrial Revolution. Between 1826 and 1830, a railway line was built between Whitstable and Canterbury. It brought fish and shellfish into the interior from the coast here at Whitstable. An exchange was tourism. People from Canterbury enjoyed visits to the seaside. And this is one of the very first railways ever built in the world. And it was built by George Stevenson, who delegated a lot of the work to his son, Robert Stevenson, who became a great friend of Brunel. And all these men had met before Thomas Telford, such a famous engineer, they'd named Telford after him in Shropshire, and the other bridges I've done in videos. And Telford came here and supervised the building of the harbour. Now I'm understood, this is the third railway ever built in the world and in Britain. It's in the Guinness Book of Records. It's the world's first regular passenger service to issue season tickets, which was in 1834. And I'm standing next to one of the very first locomotives in the world, the Invicta, built by the Stevensons and brought down here by ship. And it was in part, so it was assembled here. It was in parts for a safe journey by sea. A lot of locomotives arrived in situ and they were assembled. Telford's Harbour opened in 1832 and in 1835 Brunel was here because when he was building the railway line between Bristol and London he was quizzed by the parliamentary committee about the severe gradients that would be incurred on the line relatively speaking and some of the gradient was inside the box tunnel and there was a theory that in a tunnel nearly two miles long trains will emerge at 120 miles an hour. So Brunel came to the railway line here to observe the gradients. One author says he only went to the tunnel, but Brunel said that he traveled up and down the railway line several times, which is nearly seven miles long with a rise of 61 meters. And in places, there was a cable which was linked to the hook at the front of this locomotive to haul the trains up steep gradients such as one in 46. Now I'm going to introduce you to Peter who is a trustee of the museum and him and his son are experts on the railway line and Peter's going to come into shot and he's going to provide the infill. What I would like you to tell us is what experiments did Brunel do here please Peter? Well, we understand that he was very concerned uh, about how quickly um, and how slowly wagons could stop after having gone down a really steep incline. And uh, the incline underneath what's now the University of Kent um, was, uh, I think, up to 1 in 36 in places, which in those days uh, was almost like a cliff face uh, for railways. Um, and I understand um, that his experiments involved uh, starting off the... Uh, wagons down the hill towards Canterbury and then applying the brakes to see how quickly they would stop um, and it would appear that they were satisfied that under all circumstances the wagons could be stopped within a, a reasonable distance. Outside you've got some stationary engines and we talk about the railway being operated by rope. Can you explain what that is all about please? Yes indeed. Uh, the first locomotives um, would basically not go up hills. I think the steepest hill that Stevenson's rocket was expected to go up was one in 96. Um, the gradients in Whitstable are one in 50, one in 36, one in 46. Um, and so in those days, that was considered far too steep for a locomotive. So the solution here um, was to use the locomotive just at the Whitstable end for two miles, where the gradient was still one in 50 but no steeper and then at the Canterbury end they used two stationary steam engines also made by Robert Stevenson um, on top of the two hills um, and the one at Tyler Hill which is near the university we believe had a drum of rope which must have been about 1.7 miles long and the rope ran in pulleys in the middle of the two main tracks. So how big was the rope then in circumference? It, one would think rope would have snapped by hauling 
a massive dead weight like this? Well, or I to think break inertia, for example. My, my my guess is that the circumference might have been about five inches, but only that's five inches. that's only a guess. Um, it is significant that next door to the museum, in the in the chemists, we that was originally a rope works in the around 1830. So we do wonder whether the rope was made or at least could have been repaired locally. Between here and Canterbury, if people walk along the existing part of the line, what can the visitor see that Bruno would have seen? Well, the, the main thing is, is to be observant of the slopes. Um, and particularly if you cycle the path, you realise quite how steep it is. It, it doesn't feel quite as steep walking, obviously, but cycling, most people, me, frankly, will get off their bikes and walk up the hill. So observing the, the slopes. Um, at the top of Clowes Wood, um, there's a public picnic area with a big round pond, which would have been the pond that fed the water for the stationary steam engine. And at the bottom of that hill, a place charmingly called Bog's Hole, um, there is still a bridge, um, a brick arch just off the track, um, which was originally an accommodation bridge for the farm, so that the farmer could get from one side of the embankment to another. Those two engine places are the main features on the line. Can you tell us about the tunnel? Well, um, the, the tunnel I think was the best part of half a mile long um, and I, I think there are comments about two million bricks and things like that um, and, and it, it was constructed because the St Stephen's Hill where the university is is really very steep and so a cutting would have been even more expensive. Um, unfortunately the tunnel um, has now been filled in or backfilled most of it um, because there was an incident with the University of Kent and one of the buildings unfortunately um, subsided into the tunnel. Um, fortunately it was the end of the building that did not have the computer in in those days um, so no enormous problem was caused um, but as a result the tunnel was filled in which is a huge shame because it would be great to be able to walk through the tunnel nowadays. Yeah, so just to conclude this video then, I'm extremely pleased to meet Peter because this part of Brunel's life is barely known. It's hardly ever mentioned in the books. So I'm very grateful that Peter is able to provide the info for this fascinating topic. Thanks for listening. My pleasure.